Thank you. Thank you both. And we've got plenty to talk about this week, including the Olympics getting underway in Paris. Were you watching last night in TV? Will a star-studded comic revival of a beloved 1980s movie be worth a stream later? And are you one of the reported half of UK adults who either don't read or have given up on books? guests today. We've got journalist Angela Haggerty, author CJ Cook and Herald columnist Brian Beacom. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. And this week we're going to be talking about last night's opening ceremony. Despite the sabotage, have the Paris Olympics got off to the right start? We'll look across the pond as Biden steps down and Harris steps up, complete with endorsement from the Obamas. And there's a star-studded comic revival of a cult 80s movie to chew over. Will it be worth a stream later? Plus, are you one of the half of UK adults who don't read or have given up? And if so, what could tempt you back to a book? Let's have a listen to some of this week's big moments. Nothing can come in the way of saving our democracy. That includes personal ambition. I, I, I can't have this phone call without saying to my girl Kamala, I am proud of you. She was a bum three weeks ago. She was a bum, a failed vice president. Pestilence is everywhere. But a few weeks in the countryside so could do wonders for your health. Friends! Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Villa Santa. I'm a sort of competitor that I go in and I am very like in it to win it and Pete definitely takes that on. We're effectively run in this country by a bunch of childless cat ladies. Hi, I'm Elspeth Tassioli. I'm the thingy thing. The thingy thing. The outside observer. This is DVD. It looks and sounds like you're at the movies. 
All that and more to come here in BBC Radio Scotland with me, Shireen Nanjani. And do get in touch with your thoughts on anything we're talking about this morning. You can drop me a text on 80295. That's charged at your standard message rate or use the hashtag Shireen on social media. But first to Paris, where despite large-scale arson attacks on the high-speed rail link network and torrential rain, the most ambitious and largest-scale Olympic ceremony uh, went without a hitch. It started uh, with a boat parade down the Seine featuring athletes from all competing countries. Elsewhere, there were can-can dancers, drag queens, very strange faceless torch bearers, a giant silver horse and an incredible hot air balloon display. Swapping a stadium for a waterway for the first time to open the greatest show on earth. The near four hour spectacle included surprise performances with a cabaret number from US singer-songwriter Lady Gaga as well as an emotional return of Canadian icon Celine Dion who brought the ceremony to a glittering climax. Celine Dion uh, performing Edith Piaf. Uh, that was very I- I- an emotional moment, um, Carol, and, and not just because of where it was, uh, it, it was also because it was her first live performance in four years, a year and a half after she revealed a diagnosis of stiff person syndrome. She thought she was never going to be able to sing again. It was very moving to see her sing, actually. Um, I was rooting for her and it was a nice moment to end the ceremony on as well. Mm-hmm. What what did you think of the ceremony? Take us through it. How much did you watch? I got quite fed up with the sheer number of boats passing through in the procession. I thought it was very dispersed. The cameras didn't seem to know where to go. It just seemed to be, someone said it was uh, largely a procession of very wet athletes waving and I I do agree with that because You know, Stop the Boats was actually trending on Twitter. Oh, I see. At one point. That's good. Um, Yeah, that that was my mindset as well. I thought, oh, are we only on F? Um, But it was definitely nice to to see Celine Dion there, especially since that biography pointed out how Mm -hmm. ill she's been and and losing her voice is so cruel. Yeah. So it was great. She did really well. Other visual visual highlights? I mean, despite the the, the boats, which did take a long time. Yeah, the, the, the Smurf thing was quite curious, but I'm not sure he was meant to be... Papa Smurf. I think he was meant to be Dionysus. Ah, right. That character uh, painted blue. So yes. that was quite interesting. But it was very confusing, a lot of it. I wasn't sure of some of the references they were trying to make. Yeah. Uh, what, what did you think of the, the, the way it was done, Brian? Uh, I, 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 I really had to ask some big questions of the organisers in this one because nobody <laughs> at, at any point at ever time, any time just sit down and said, well, listen, what's going to happen if it rains? I mean, we're talking about Celine Dion there, who's really famous for the title Titanic song, isn't she? And uh, but you know, as we know, the Titanic sunk, and I think this just a bit sank as well. I think the big problem they had was continually watching athletes looking drowned and as if they'd just been dredged up from a riverbank. One of the saddest things for me. Uh, was watching Tom Daly wrapped up in one of those little plastic rainmate things, trying to raise a smile, and he looked absolutely sodden. Do you know? I, I w- worry about you know the, the, uh, how many athletes are going to come down with a cold after standing at the pouring rain. Uh, absolutely, and I had a real fear in my in, in my heart as well when I was looking at one of the platforms when they brought out the modern dance section, and you had these dancers, you know, performing some really really tricky steps, and they, they were slipping. You could yeah. see it was so difficult to hold their feet. 
Who in their right mind thought that this is a really clever idea just to take it and run it out, outdoors, up and down the Seine? I think it was insane. And th the 300,000-odd people who watched it as well didn't have a fantastic experience from what I'm picking up from listening to Vox Pops and radio this morning as well. It was very, very difficult to see. And even though you, in television you get a good insight into something like the scaffolding scene where the dancers were climbing up and down poles and they were... That uh, was in uh, Notre Dame. In Notre yeah. Dame. Yeah, that, that, that looked OK in television, but you're not going to see so much of that when you're standing yeah, well, I think I think they had some big screens. A highlight for me was that silver horse galloping across uh, uh, the Seine. And it certainly looked better when uh, night nightfall came yeah, because I you had the lights... I think that there was something mystical about that yes. and, but, and, and something evocative of something interesting and fascinating to come. So we, we, we got all of it. We got a real sense of it. But but but, but overall, I thought the, 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 the production values weren't fantastic. Um, and did it lead to an, an anticipation of real excitement to come in the games? I think, if anything, it really took away from that and it probably flattened the expectation. Well, I, th I think they will be glad to have got through it. Over it. <laughs> um, uh, after you know the, a, a day of tension with these um, arson attacks, and you know Angela, there is you know still worries about. Um, I, I'm just seeing that quarter of all Eurostar services are cancelled until Monday, and you know they're they're, they're still worried that, that there could be more disruption. Yeah, I know. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind. I'm. Ho I know that the Olympics isn't on for a very very long time, but I'm hoping that maybe these attacks were were meant to make an impact at the the very early bit on the opening day when everybody in the world is watching and everybody's travelling. So I'm kind of hoping for the spectators and for the athletes that maybe that would calm down um, as the time goes on. But it, you know we really have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame, you know. I think these big sporting events, it's it's always an opportunity for people who want to make a point about something to to try and do so. But for so many people, I always feel bad for the athletes in particular yeah. in Olympics because they wait four years to, to go to this. And so their careers really aren't that long in terms of, you know, it's so hard to even qualify that it really just takes such a shine off it for them. So it's, it's a real shame to see that. Yeah. And, and speaking of the athletes, um, it, lo lovely to see um, Rafa Nadal uh, getting handed the torch from Zinedine uh, Zidane and Serena Williams uh, as well carrying the torch. And the woman next to her was Nadia Komenich, um, Carolyn, the... Um, Romanian gymnast. The commentators didn't know her, her, her name last night, but I've, we found out afterwards, uh, struggling to, to keep their balance. But, uh, you know, nice to see those th th those big names there. And of course, absolutely. Andy Murray as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, Brian, Andy Murray, um, obviously he announced this week what we already knew, but but that, that he is retiring um, yeah. and that he had to pull out of the singles and we're going to see him in the doubles. So that will be his last time. I mean, this is going to be pretty special. Yeah, it's going to be pretty special. I mean, I think the question was, is this a fitting tribute to, to the end of Andy's career? And um, I, actually, I don't think it is. I think a fitting tribute... Oh, the Olympics? Have, he loves being in the Olympics. Well, he does, but, but I, I think a fitting tribute would have been to go out at Wimbledon having beaten uh, Djokovic in the final of that would have been the real tribute um, it's 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 compensation it's something it, it, it does put him on the world stage again which is yeah. which is fantastic it's a wee bit of a shame that it's, that it's doubled I'd like to see him play singles for one last time but the body's just not up to it no, so, so at least he gets a chance to wave goodbye I think that's the hugely important thing and we get a chance to, to sit there and probably shed a little tear and thinking oh I'll be shedding a tear I, I cried Buckets at Wimbledon when he did that interview with Sue Barker. I was just yeah, I, I, inconsolable. E even me, hard faced, <laughs> torn faced journalist. Uh, yeah, there's been I've I've shed quite a few tears for Andy over the time, <laughs> and I would imagine there'll be a little um, bit of wetness in the eye <laughs> on Sunday. <laughs> Well, plays with Dan Evans in the doubles. Yeah, well, obviously there's a lot more than tennis. All the sport is getting underway. Do you normally watch a lot of the Olympics, Carolyn? I try to. Um, uh -huh. I try to. I, I think it's helpful to, to have access to it. Um, but I noticed that the BBC is, is providing us with sort of um, 250 hours, I think it is. So maybe it's highlights that they're bringing to us. So what, what would you watch? <laughs> 
Um, I I think I'm really really invested in um, the the races in the um, oh god I can't remember the name of it. The there's always stuff. things that you can never remember the name <laughs> of in the Olympics. Things I've never heard of before. The, the shot yes. put is that what you're yes. talking about? So, ah, right. Thing, anything oh, anything that involves throwing Are things. You serious? Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but I think that's an interesting point. I mean, for me, the Olympics of yesteryear was was much much more interesting. I sound like you know somebody who's very very old in this situation. Yes, you do. It, but the, yeah, <laughs> thank you. But, the, you know, it's a bit of a chicken, chicken situation. We all, the, the Olympics of, of, of past years, it was all those about Cole versus Everett. It was always about, you know, how how well um, Daley Thompson would do. We had we had big names, we had personalities. And the problem is there aren't the, the same amount of personalities or, or if there aren't, um, do we just care less about them? Or you just don't know them. Well, well mm-hmm. yeah, well, okay, well, here's, an, here's something that I, I tried this week. I went into a Netflix programme called sprint and it's it, it focuses on the biggest sprinters from across the world and it traces them back over a year and for me it was a chance to learn about these characters and the personalities to see if there's somebody i could connect with all i found were these super egos and vainglorious people who just kept telling the camera how wonderful they are and they're going to be the next big thing i don't think that was really what a- athletics or what what um <laughs> sprinting or, or sport should really be about about that massive massive ego and i know you need an ego to be successful but i can't remember um you know when alan wells won the you know the 100 meters um, him ripping his, his shirt off his vest off at the end of it and saying look at me how wonderful I'm. i think it needs to be about real character and real personality and uh, i don't i'm not seeing Seen any of that emerging at this moment? I, I, time. I don't think you, you've seen enough. You don't know. You Maybe. don't know. I mean, well, I'm it hasn't started. Yet. Well, okay. Well, <laughs> you can, can anybody here give me, you know, five major names that they're looking forward to Brian, watching in this I, Olympics? Angela? I, I, I can give you give you one name. This is a shameless plug here, but my little cousin Louis Lawler is going to be competing for Team GB in the swimming and the Paralympics. So there you go. Wow, that's the name. That's the name. That is fantastic, <laughs> and, and that, that that will be starting at the end of August. Is that right, Angela? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the exact dates, yeah. but it's it's always just after the Olympics, isn't it? Yes. So, uh, yeah, really excited for that. But he actually competed in the last Paralympics as well, and I think he was only 18 or 19 when he first qualified for the Olympi- for the Paralympics. So that's just incredible, and he's there again. I'm so proud of him. So good luck, Louis. Oh, good luck to him. Well, we'll f- follow him when it uh, when that starts. Will you be watching at any of the Olympics? Is, is it the sort of thing, Angela, that you find yourself watching things that you'd never heard of before and getting strangely <laughs> captivated by yeah. them? Yeah. Do you know, I loved when it was Olympics when I was a kid because it, because the TV coverage was, it was just on all the time. That's yeah. what it felt like nothing else was on. And I got really into gymnastics. That's just amazing to watch. Love that. And actually the swimming as well, I always really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. I'm not crazy about the race. And there's a lot of the ones that everyone always talks about that I never really got into. But you get such like broad coverage. You got a little bit of everything. I think it's a great thing for kids is a, a little introduction into what some of these sports are going to be like. So... Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, yeah, I might try and get my wee boy into it this year, see if he's taken by anything. It'll be interesting to see how much it grows on us because, I mean, in the past, I'm going back again here, but I, I love swimming as well. We had Mark Spitz and, and people like that as well. David Wilkie, the, the, you know, the, who, who was absolutely tremendous. But we seem to know the names before we came to the event. Now we're having to pick up the names and we're going to have to watch to, to try and see who emerges as the, the standout characters. And, of course, I, mean, I, I will watch towards the end when it gets to the tickly bit when you get to the 100 meter final and you can't not watch that but does anybody i mean the, the fastest man in the world at the moment is noah lyles has is, is anybody ever heard of him mm, well no no, no, no i haven't but no. you know no. there you go but <laughs> we will be watching him on the day yeah um as carolyn mentioned um angela less coverage this year you remember it from the days where it was just not non-stop the, the bbc will have less coverage uh because um it's been split between the BBC Discovery Plus uh, and Eurosport. Do you think um, that will affect people's engagement with it here? Possibly. I think that's a real shame because, as I say, as a kid, it was something because it, it dominated the coverage. You couldn't really not watch it. So you found yourself being taken in by the Olympics into sports that you would never really care about otherwise. And it just became a thing. You know, you felt like you were part of the event. But I guess the, the problem is now, you know, it's not the same as when I was a kid. The BBC and other channels are competing with, with other broadcasters, streaming services. You know, it's a totally different media landscape. So maybe it's just kind of necessary that it has to change. But yeah. 
but I, will it make it feel like less of an event that we're all involved in? I think it probably will. Yeah. But yeah. You can st- you're still going to get 250 hours of live television, then you're still going to get streaming services and BBC iPlayer. So I, I don't think we'll lose out too much there. We can see whatever we want when we want to see it. Okay. So apart from the shot putt, what else will you be watching, <laughs> Carolyn? <laughs> I think the swimming. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm very invested in uh, synchronised swimming as well. I think I think that's a real spectacle moment. It is. And there's this new kayak thing that's, uh, that's out this year. I'm not entirely sure, the, I, I think they sort of fling the kayak into the water. It sounds It's mad. interesting. And, and then there's and break dancing as well, although they don't call it break dancing. Yeah, the, actually it's been postponed today because it's too, too uh, wet, too oh. wet I think. <laughs> or maybe that was one of the other ones. But yeah. Uh, so there's always something new. Um, but Brian, um, Alex is in uh, Edinburgh is picking up what we're picking up, that you're being a real misery guts. He says, has somebody stolen Brian's scone? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I had a scone and a cup of tea, yeah, you're absolutely right, Alex. Maybe I'd be a little bit happier at this point in time. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get Matt on to it. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see if he, can, he cheers up during the, the rest of the show. Yeah. But we know him well. I wouldn't count on it. <laughs> To put a smile on your face Some people think we're funny Some think we're a disgrace We don't care, we'll stay on air Every single morning Cause listening to the other shows Is just dull and boring And still to come here on BBC Radio Scotland with me, Shireen Nanjani, a beloved 1980s fantasy movie gets a TV reboot, reboot even, (laughs) created by Taika Waititi and starring Lisa Kudrow. Will it be worth a stream later? And we're looking across the pond to Biden stepping aside. Will it, in his words, save democracy? But first, I am here with my guests, Angela Haggerty, CJ Cook and Brian Beacom. It's time to get your moments of the week. Um, and Angela, yours go, goes back to this time last week, but actually yeah. during the week I saw a very lovely photograph on social media um, of you at this event. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit, but it was only a week ago. So it was um, <laughs> Glasgow Pride was, uh, was, was happening this day last week. And I took my little boy, he's four. Um, and before the actual march, we went to a brunch that was held by the Thai campaign. That's the Time for Inclusive Education campaign. And, um, and I came across them years ago when I was working as an editor and they were just starting out. Um, and I became actually very good friends with the, the co-founders Liam Stevenson and Jordan Daly um, and we've remained friends ever since so they invited me along to this brunch and to bring my little boy and it was actually lovely because to think that back then when I first knew them and they were starting out with their campaign you know I didn't have my little boy so it's nice to be able to bring him to a thing like that particularly when it's geared around education and their idea really was just that you know kids that are that are, that are gay at school um, have faced a lot of really tough things you know there can be bullying there could just be a lot of issues for them that can have a, a huge impact on their mental health. So they wanted to do something to change that and incredibly they, they succeeded with their campaign. So it was lovely to go there and then take my little boy on the march. And a couple of people commented to me since to say that it's not the kind of thing that their parents would have taken them to. Me too, because you know, I grew up in Isle of Butte, there was no pride marches mm. there then there it actually is now um so there's the kind of thing parents didn't always take kids to but now you see much more families and m- many more kids at these events than you would have done and these people were saying that that could have made such an impact for them when they were a kid just to have been exposed to that and to know that it was okay to 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 talk to their parents about the, these things to be open about these things so i just thought it's what a lovely thing to, to to give to my son you know that these kids that are growing up today can grow up with very different ideas and attitudes and maybe it then doesn't have the negative impact on them that it that it has for so many kids and the lovely thing was on the, on the day when we were waiting to join into the march um, there was a photographer around who captured a lovely photograph of me and my son I had no idea he was taking any pictures um, and it was just such a natural lovely photo and he managed to, he didn't know who I was either but he managed to track me down on Twitter later that day to get the photo over he said it was the first photo that he'd taken of the day and he thought it was the 
the best one because it was just such a lovely idea, you know, of a, a parent and a child at an event like that with such, you know, beautiful colours and yeah. a great vibe and great moods with everyone. It's just, just a lovely thing. So yeah. I was really happy to do that last week. It was a lovely photo too. Um, Carolyn, your moment of the week. Well, I've mentioned before that I'm a massive fan of the Merlin Bird app. Which you've introduced us all to, yeah. <laughs> I hope you all have it downloaded. It's free. It's developed by the Cornell Lab. It identifies birds nearby based on their song. And this week it identified for me a new bird, which is actually a missile thrush. I'd never heard of a missile thrush. I've heard of it, but I've not heard one. A missile thrush. And what's lovely is now the app has been developed so it'll play back its song so that you can hear it yourself and this bird is a bird of concern because its numbers have been in decline since the 70s so that was lovely to see how does it sound can you give it <laughs> i'm afraid i couldn't i couldn't quite replicate it uh, so this was where just in my back garden which is in in bridge of Weir, right. and so it's nice just to sit out there i'm, I'm semi-rural so it's nice to be able to pick up um birds and occasionally i do get buzzards nearby as well but this was a new one so it's always a nice moment i think it's a wonderful app so yeah well actually thanks to that app i identified um a few weeks after you were telling us about this a sparrow hawk sitting in our garden <gasps> I, I wow. looked out and all the birds had disappeared from the bird feeder. And then there was this big, and, and I took the picture and the, um, the, the app told me it was a sparrow hawk. So I didn't Amazing. know I had them. So anyway, um, uh, from that uh, <laughs> divergence of nature, um, have you had your scone yet? Have you got as a, an uplifting moment of the week? <laughs> no, it's, it's sadly, uh, I think it was it was. A You're Mark, staying in character, are you? Yeah, I'm staying in character. Okay. I think the Mark Fonda is going to be, be really disappointed. I got I, I, I got some real tragic news this week. Um, I got a call from George in the bike shop, and he made the announcement. He said, "Your bike is dead. Ah, it's got two broken wheels." And he said, "After 27 years, and I've put a new gear system, I put new wheels, I put new brakes." And he said, "You've spent more money in this bike, and th th then it would cost you to buy a new one." And he said, "It's not your bike anymore. It's it's, it's like triggers broom. It's all bits of something else." And then I had this big long debate with George, and I said, "George, it's not a bike, and this is where it get really sad." I said, "It's an escape. It's all about hope. It's helped me recover from knee problems, countless groin strains, and backache." And it's taken me away from the worries of the day. It's taken me to the shops, to the pub, to meet friends, to the doctors. That George, I can't give up this bike. And he said, you need to take it to the dump. And then I, I sat there for Let a moment. <laughs> I sat there. Well, that's what George was saying. But I sat there for a moment and I thought, what is this really about? Why am I so reluctant? It's just a bike. It's just a lump of metal. And then I kind of half realised that, that that's not just a bike. It's about what I'm going through at this moment in time. Because this this very same week, I went to the dentist and he told me I've got some major root problems with a tooth. It's going to cost a lot of money to get fixed. Um, I've been to see a hand specialist. There's I've got tendon problems and needs an operation as well. So I thought, this isn't about the bike that's falling apart. This is about me that's falling apart. This is about me not being able to contend with the fact that I may be ready for the dump. So, but what I've got to do, and I appreciate this, I've got to, to phone up George and say, okay, look, just get me a new bike. Yeah. I need a new one. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. Um, Carolyn, on your missile thrush, Pauline near Keith in Murray has texted on 80295. She says, we call a missile thrush a mavis. And every time you see one, it's a loved one who's passed away come to visit. Oh, that is beautiful. I had no idea. A mavis. A mavis, yeah. I will remember that. That's lovely. And Miriam has uh, been in touch on the Olympics to bring us some much needed positivity, Brian. Mm -hmm. That ceremony, she says, was a feat of creative genius and superb organisation and beauty. Did no one else feel the goosebumps? Let's be positive for the team. I'm not allowing you any comeback to that, Brian, at all. <laughs> this is Shireen. With my guests Angela Haggerty, CJ Cook and Brian Beacom. Now, you might remember the 1981 comic fantasy adventure movie 
Time Bandits, produced by Python, Terry Gilliam, and starring Sean Connery, John Cleese, Michael Palin and Shelley Duvall. It became a bit of a cult classic. Well, a new twist on it this week as Taika Waititi brings us a TV reboot starring Lisa Kudrow. It premiered on Wednesday on Apple TV and is described as a comedic journey through time and space with a ragtag group of thieves and their newest recruit, an 11-year-old history nerd. Why can't you be a normal person with normal friends? We'll have Scott. You're stuck in the past, Kevin. you got to stop it with all these Vikings and the ancient geeks. Greeks. As well. Mom, my wardrobe's moving. On. How is he here? What's going on? Your room. It's a time egress. He's never done that before. And it allows us to travel throughout the universe. Tell me who you are, or I will kill you. I am Penelope, and I am, in effect, the leader. Well, fundamentally, though, we are all equal. Who are you guys? We're the Time Bandits, a crack team of expert thieves. Nothing is too big for us to steal. Oh, OK, now that we're close, maybe it is too big to steal. <laughs> OK, that gives you a flavour of the Time Bandits. I have to admit, I never saw the Terry Gilliam film um, of, from 1981. I know that people that did see it, it was much loved by them. And you're one of those people that, that loved it. Carolyn. I absolutely adore the original and it made me realise how many times I must have watched the original because I've not seen it for a long time. Really? Yet. As I watched this, I was just completely taken back. So I can even remember lines from the original. So I must have just watched that on repeat as a child. So for, for people who are big fans of the original, tell us, I mean, this is a 10 part series. How does this differ? Well, I think it it follows the original very closely and it does, for me, capture the vibe and the mood of the original. I, I, I think Taika Waititi really is very true to that Terry Gilliam manic, quirky, um, you know, the the overall tone of the original is, is very captured here, but he does depart from that he does you know go different places with the plot there's different kind of scenes but the the idea is very much there um and the central casting of that child actor who's quite nerdy Cal L. Tuck I'd never heard of him before but he's, he's brilliant. brilliant he's so good and and I was really pleased to see because it you know, that was the original as well. You have this this boy who is just obsessed with history and then he goes on this, it's a romp essentially, a historical romp, which is funny and interesting. And we have the same thing here. We also have some really brilliant comedians in these roles. We've got Ross Noble. Yes, he was he was part of the construction, um, the, 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 the construction guys that were building Stonehenge. That's right. It was the, a really even funny even had a, a gift shop. Yes, that, that little <laughs> quote is that that's right it's just a landmark with a gift shop and that really made me laugh so it was it was great so how does do you think it compares though for you i find it difficult to you know uh, I, I still prefer the original. It made me want to go back and, and watch the original. But perhaps when I do that, I'll appreciate this a little bit more. But I right. did think it was good and it was family friendly and I would watch it with my children. Right. Angela, what about you? You're like me. You'd never seen the film, so nothing to compare it to. No, and I, I was I had no idea what I was watching, to be honest with you, when I first went into it. I was like, what is this? Um, and it was weird because it starts off with this very kind of boring British household with the kid and the two parents who are glued to their smartphones on the couch watching the TV, not paying attention to the kid. You know, and I was just like, this is a bit weird for Apple TV. It's usually really kind of glamorous and extravagant. But then, at, lo and behold, as you go on, they build that into it. And it's weird because it's simultaneous got this kind of old feel to it mm. 
but it's got the, these more modern effects and it's just I think there's something very clever about the way that they've produced this and I have to say anything on Apple TV I find it, it's, it just ends up being really good even if it's a plot line you don't think you'd be interested in because it, the production is just terrific and the other thing it's with called this, money <laughs> yeah and the other thing with this is I think it taps into a little area that maybe doesn't get enough attention by streaming platforms um, and that's something that parents can watch with kids that you both get something out of yes because at the moment it's you know I've got a young child and it's just seems, seems like cartoons I'm bored out in my mind this is the kind of thing I maybe wouldn't go out of my way to watch it on my own but I would actually love to sit down on like a family night and do that and we're missing a lot of TV programs like that on the streaming platforms so it's good to see from that perspective yeah it really is I and mean, Taika Waititi is, is really good at that Brian yeah absolutely I've got to slightly disagree with um, Carol Carolyn's tone about the, the comparison between the original film and the, the series. I, I thought the original film was quite good and I thought it was a great adventure story. But I think what this does, it's not so faithful in the sense that I think we were really doing this one is really get inside that, that little boy's head. And what it does incredibly well is it captures the sense of the modern day outsider. This is a wee boy who lives in his own head, who lives in his own bedroom and he's entirely captivated by history. And uh, I think what, that, what this series does is it really brings that to the fore and it shows that this geeky boy... So was that less to the fore in the film? Y yeah, yeah I, yeah, I felt so, yeah. Um, I think the, the, the film was more of an original adventure tale, which which worked fine. But I think this is a bit more of a wee bit of a kind of mini psychological drama. And because they've got that wee boy accentuated so well, they can really, really punch up the laughs, the incredible differences, be not only between him and his, his, his parents who are semi-moronic, but also between the, the uh, these time bandits as well, who are essentially thieves. But I think what it's also done is is, is, is use the, the, the time bandits in an incredible way to, to highlight the, the humour and the potential when you've got these these um, sort of um, sort of warlord characters racing around time and, and dipping into different parts of history, there's a wee bit of a horrible history element to it as well. But I I, I just love the I love the elemental parts in it, and I love the car the, the gang's fighter for example. He's called Beatleg, and he's described as having the strength of seven men. Except when he gets into a fight, you see him getting beaten up, and he's carried away in a stretcher, and he, all he says is there were eight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I and, I, and a mention for. Lisa Kudrow, um, uh, obviously yeah. Phoebe f from Friends, she, she was funny too. Yeah, Carolyn, no, she, and, she was really good I, I because it, it, and she actually made me think of Shelley Duvall in the original, who was oh, fantastic. that's the character that she was playing. I right. don't think she was playing that character, but there is there is very much. I feel that there are subtle nods. It was very cleverly done. There is nods to these different kind of moments that weren't necessarily repeated, but we we had them in there in spirit. Yeah, I gave her the and, little one-liners, the side of the mouth little comments. Yeah, she's whatsoever. very good at that. But but also lots of little contemporary references that bring it up to date. I like that when he was berating himself for relying on a secondary source after he was proved wrong. And when the Viking on storms into his house, the first thing he says to this massive Viking warrior who's in his own room, he said, could you tell me why the Vikings suddenly stopped their murderous ways and adopted agrarianism? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can see that. And one of the writers in this, I think it's a, an in-betweeners writer, Ian Morris, you can see there's a real flavour of modern day comedy and darkness in that as well. Yeah. Uh, Angela, so you, this is a thumbs up from you and you're going to watch, yeah. I think there's there's two episodes available on Apple and then it's one a week after that for, uh, yeah, there's 10 episodes, but you'll continue with it, yeah. Yeah, and I think I'm, 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 my son's maybe a wee bit young, but I still think he, that he would be able to enjoy parts of this, so I think it's something great to watch with him. Okay. I just wish I were 10. <laughs> I would watch it all, all the time. Well, I, I think we've we've established that it's, uh, it's good family-friendly viewing that you can watch together. Time Bandits, uh, first two episodes available on Apple TV, um, and then it's one a week after that. A couple here on your bike moment, Brian. Mm -hmm. Archie from Inverness says, In 1991, I sold someone a rather beautiful bike, a Pashley. I saw it last week 
uh, for the first time since it looked brand new. Oh. So you might see your bike all, <laughs> all done up if you get rid of it. This texter adds, no one can understand the feelings you have for a treasured bike. I adore my 25-year-old ladies tourer bought in a clearance sale. But save your old bike and do something with the parts. <laughs> some advice for you. Uh, on the, <laughs> on the Olympics, on Ben in Edinburgh says, no Olympics viewing for me and my family. Why? Unhealthy media coverage and high finance attached to it, plus elitism is rife. Also, too many niche sports that shouldn't be in the go- games at all. It's all gone a bit silly. Mm. And finally, here's Brian and Paisley with some very specific instructions. Shireen, take a wander on Eldersley Golf Course, hole numbers four and five. Almost certain you will see three missile thrushes. <gasps> yes. Three missile thrushes, and I know Eldersley Golf Course. I will head there soon. (laughs) And still to come, HMV say more people are buying DVDs and Blu-ray discs. Are you one of them? And if so, why? Plus, we'll look at Charlotte Dujardin's shock exit from the Olympics following revelations over her treatment of her horse. But now to the USA, where a few days on from quitting the presidential race on Sunday, current President Joe Biden appeared in a televised address to explain why he decided to step away from his faltering campaign. I believe my record as president, my leadership in the world, my vision for America's future all merited a second term. But nothing, nothing can come in the way of saving our democracy. That includes personal ambition. Well, that White House speech marked Biden's first public appearance since he left the race on the 21st of July, paving the way for Kamala Harris to run for the party's nomination. What what did you make of the way he came across there, Carolyn? Well, I think it was a face-saving move, and that's very clear from what's been broadcast, and it didn't necessarily it wasn't about saving democracy i think um for him that you know george clooney for instance uh stood up and and, um, made a public uh not condemnation but criticism i suppose and he faced a lot of pressure we know this um and he waited 23 days i think before stepping down so there was a real feeling wasn't there that that this is the step that he should take um so yeah i'm not sure it's that sincere but um, I think it's a positive move. Right. Do you, do you think it's too late? Is that what you're saying? I don't think it's too late. I think it's late, but it's good that it's it's happened. And, you know, it would be wonderful to see a, a female president. Well, we'll come to her in a moment. But um, what about um, Biden's address um, for you, Angela? How do you think he came across... I think he, he comes across as a man who didn't want to leave, mm-hmm. um, and he's and he's probably feeling a bit bitter and upset about it. Uh, he obviously thought he had four more years and had things he wanted to do in four years, but this is a mess that the Democrats have made. I think I'm sure that he said something when he was first elected about how he would be, you know, kind of an interim and he would be handing the baton over to someone younger. And that's that's changed somewhere along the line. And the, the problem is the Democrats didn't do anything significant to to stop that. You know, they should have four years ago been lining up the successor. At least two years ago, there should have been some serious moves being made. But to leave it to the point that they did and then start coming out publicly to express concerns about his ability and his age. I didn't like that. You know, I, I just thought a lot of it was very distasteful, even if they felt it was ultimately necessary. Um, so I, I do feel a bit sorry for, for Joe Biden because he's, you know, he's given a, a life of service and I hate... I hate the idea that it's someone's age that eventually has to to bring them down from something when they feel yeah. that they can go further. But it, it 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 had to happen because if anything, it was the Democrats were sabotaging their own candidate. Mm-hmm. And if he had carried on into the November election, then I think they would have found it very difficult. Mm-hmm. Well, let, let's move on to uh, Kamala Harris. And before we do, I've heard so many different pronunciations of her name this week, including from President Trump, who has been accused of doing it deliberately. Mispronouncing names has been cited as a racist microaggression. In fact, Harris herself has a track record of publicly correcting people who get it wrong. In 2016, when she was running for Senate, she put out this video. It's not Kamala. It's not Kamala. It's not 
not Kamala. It's Kamala. Kamala Harris. Well, the senator says that she's used to people mispronouncing her name, but says it's easy to remember. Just combine comma with law, and you get Kamala. It doesn't quite work in an American accent, though. So BBC presenter Tina, Tina Dahili gave us a handy tip this week, too. It is Kamala Harris. According to her own memoir in 2019, uh, Kamala Harris says it's like the punctuation mark, comma, Kamala, Kamala Harris. OK, so that is the, the pronunciation. Um, um, but on to the, the, the politics. Um, Kamala, uh, <laughs> I just did it wrong there. Kamala Harris uh, enjoyed a rapturous welcome as she took to the stage to launch a campaign for nomination, which she's likely to win. Opinion polls so far suggest a bounce since she took over uh, Mr Biden's mantle. They're neck and neck at the moment. And this week, a serious boost for a campaign in the shape of the Obamas. Kamala! Yeah. Hi. Hey there. Oh, hi. You're both together. Oh, it's good to hear you both. I, I, I can't have this phone call without saying to my girl Kamala, I am proud of you. This is going to be historic. We called to say Michelle and I couldn't be prouder to endorse you and to do everything we can to get you through this election and, and into the Oval Office. Oh, my goodness. Michelle, Brock, this means so much to me. Well, with Harris poised to lead the Democrat campaign, what does Donald Trump make of her? She was a bum three weeks ago. She was a bum. A failed vice president in a failed administration with millions of people crossing, and she was the border czar. Now they're trying to say she never was the border czar. She had nothing to do with the border. She was the border czar. Well, that was Donald Trump um, speaking last night. Um, he also deliberately mispronounced her name in, in that speech, Brian. But um, mm. what, what do you think of, uh, of Kamala Harris and, and, and her chances of beating Trump? Because he's, he's going for that particular issue on immigration, which she has you know, been criticised on. That, that is one of her, her weak points, and that, that matters to tens of millions of Americans. Well, it does matter, and I hate to, to, to kind of go along with Donald Trump in any way, shape, perform but but she has been shown to be a little bit inadequate when it has come to her only major remit which was attached to being um, vice president when she was she was in, in charge of board c c control and uh, and one of the big problems that, that really highlighted the problems with Kamala Harris is, is one journalist said there why haven't you even been to the Mexican border and her reply was, I haven't been to Europe, which um, it's, that answer is not only gobbledygook, it, it just suggests a really worrying insularity in someone hoping to become the leader of the free world. I think you've got to look at um, Kamala Harris's um, uh, history and her, her background in politics as well. Um, she's been a controversial figure in the sense that when she was a district attorney and then she became attorney general in, in the Los Angeles, um, in California, sorry. Um, I think the big problem was that she was seen to be too pro-police, that she wasn't considerate of the the, the citizenry. Um, she certainly wasn't seen to be an out-and-out -out supporter of, 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 of black people in that world. And uh, so there are big question marks about where what is our policy? And I don't. I and it's the swing states that matter for both the of them now. Swing states that matter, but but I think you know one of us. She she doesn't seem to have an absolute real strength of substance that people can hang on We'd do you think she can beat trump the polls suggest that there is a chance and but then you have to compare look this is what you're up against this is a man who describes his opponent as, as ugly and i think the the problem is that if she was strong if she were eloquent eloquent and erudite and she i think anybody could really beat trump when it came to a debate i don't even think she could stand up to him in a debate at this moment in time though i don't know if she has that capability what do you think carolyn I feel the same. Um, she's got a mixed reputation. Um, and she's not a great communicator. Um, and Trump is not a great communicator either, but, you know, he does need someone who's particularly eloquent, I suppose, and educated to beat him. So I would like to feel more confident and um, optimistic than I do. So you, you th think it could, it, it could go... You, she, it could she, go she, either way, right, which okay. is worrying. Angela? I think she can beat him. I mean, since she's, she's, you know, her reputation and she's not a great speaker, 
Yeah. Look at Trump's reputation. He's not a great speaker. Biden was never a particularly great speaker either. I've never enjoyed listening to Joe Biden, actually. Um, I don't think those are really the issues that are um, motivating Americans. I think it's bigger things. I think they're in a very cultural moment over there. They're trying to resolve something about the direction that they're going in in the future. And there's a lot of ideological stuff underpinning that. So I think that this election is less about characters. We know the character of Trump. We'll get a flavour of the character of Kamala Harris. But I think actually it's about bigger issues on the ground there. Um, and I think we still get stuck a little bit in the, the character element of it because we're kind of invested in American politics when it comes to election time. But most of us don't really understand like the mechanics of it and the things that Americans are facing. But it's definitely game on now in this election. It feels like a different election from the one we thought we were about to have. And that makes it more interesting. But we yeah. don't really know what she stands for, Angela. That's, that's the issue. But then that's, I mean, she, she's going to be moving from VP into president presidential candidate so her campaign is going to be her telling us what she stands for that Trump can't really do that we know what he is right so her advantage is that she can then come out and show well here's who I am and if Americans like it then they can vote for it okay well we're gonna to have to leave it there but it'll be interesting to see who she picks as a running mate um, as well but uh, obviously we'll be following this as it goes along Friday, August 16th, Memphis Wrestling tag teams with the Clarksburg Volleyball Team for a huge fundraiser. Get your tickets in advance at memphiswrestling.tv. And coming up at 11.30, just after us, it's Breaking the News with Des Clark's guests, including Phyllis Felicity Ward and Chris Forbes. At 12, it's Off the Ball, this time with Ray Bradshaw and Mark Nelson. And at 2 o'clock in Sports Sound, they'll have all the action from the Scottish League Cup, including commentary of Hibernian versus Peter Head. And at 6 o'clock tonight, sacked in the morning, Amy and Craig will be joined by the legendary Celtic and Leicester manager, Martin O'Neill. And looking ahead to Sunday morning, Tony Kearney is joined by former MP Mary Black, plus Olympian Hannah Miley, Iman Hassan Rabani and lawyer Rupa Mukher to discuss some of the big stories of the week from a faith and ethics perspective. That's from 8am. <laughs> With my guests, Angela Haggerty, CJ Cook and Brian Beacom. Now, remember the excitement of getting a movie on a disc. This is DVD. And this is what happens when you watch DVD. It looks and sounds like you're at the movies, but you can experience it at home. Well, we've all been told that uh, everyone's into streaming these days, but according to HMV, more people are turning to actually buying physical copies on films and TV box sets on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, Angela, does this surprise you? Not really, because I think that when you get these big bursts of technology moving you forward, you inevitably get people moving back a wee bit. <laughs> Same things happened with radio. You know, radio's going to die. The TV's here and look at us now. You know, we're all tuned into podcasts all the time. Maybe changes the form, but we still love it. And I, I think it's the same with, with books and DVDs and CDs, is that there's a physical thing about them that they are like it's an expression of who you are. You like to put them on display in your mm. house so that when people come in, they get a flavour of who you are and the experience of going into the shop and browsing and picking the thing. And, and, and There's just something about that that you can't get from a streaming service, which is just overwhelming. I mean, how many times have you sat on Netflix for an hour scrolling and then eventually... <laughs> yes, I do that a lot. <laughs> yeah. That was my evening's viewing, was actually just scrolling the menu. <laughs> <laughs> What about you? Do you still have a DVD player, Carolyn? I do and have a DVD player. Do you use it? I don't use it, but I've kept it and I've kept my DVDs. And I can really understand why a lot of people are turning back to DVDs because the streamers have become expensive. Well, there is that, isn't there? And you have to 
pay for a lot of movies. So, and I've noticed this more and more. So I think the bloom is off the rose when it comes to streamers a little bit. Uh, yeah, but when you say you have to pay a lot more once, once you've signed up for the... You're already paying the subscription, but maybe the film you want to watch, you have to buy that film. On top of the subscription. Exactly. And I've done that a few times now, and it's a bit of a pain, actually. So. Yeah. Yeah, so you'd you'd still stick with the the, the DVDs. Yes, and I, I can see the logic there that you know you if you watch a film in particular over and over again, at least you have it. Yeah, you don't have to rely on the the streamer having it because sometimes it, it won't have the film that you want to watch, or you'll have to buy it. Yeah, well, I've I've been taking lots of DVDs to charity shops um, later, and the West End of Glasgow, large student population, is a big big market for it, but. Uh, we're talking about uh, DVD box sets. Uh, maybe you've got one of the US TV drama The Good Wife, like I have. If so, perhaps you'll have been excited to see in the listings this week Elspeth. It's a spin-off series starring character Elspeth Taschioni, played by Carrie Preston. She was a, um, a regular cameo appearance. So is this new series any good? Well, let's find out. Hi, I'm Elspeth Tassioni from the thingy thing. The thingy thing? The outside observer. I think you should, um... Oh my god, I didn't even remember I was wearing that. <laughs> wow, what is all this? I mostly see crime scene photos. This is very different. Better. Excuse me? Oh, don't worry, I can see it. Now, if you'd ever seen The Good Wife or The Good Fight, um, you would recognise that voice because, um, she, she, as I say, she had these sort of regular little cameo appearances and was always quite uh, amusing, but that was in the context of a drama. Now they've built this whole thing around her, Brian, as a comedy. It also stars Wendell Pierce as, um, as the police chief who um, played Bunk in the wire so mm. a good pedigree it's also adapted um, uh, um, by Robert and Michelle King the creators of The Good Wife and The, the Good Fight so what could possibly go wrong? Uh, <laughs> just just about everything actually <laughs> and you just mentioned Wendell Pearson I was thinking when he signed up for this and he's like I said, I, well, how much have I got to do here I, I'm trying to play the series the heavy character and this is I, I'm surrounded by absolute nonsense uh, what I've got positively I, I think uh, Carrie Preston's absolutely terrific. I think she's a really, really good actor. Mm -hmm. I think she can define a character. The big problem is that you've got this incredible juxtaposition. You've got an attempt at a serious-ish detective story and then this cartoon comes in and uh, I think she's described as Columbo with a primary coloured wardrobe and fluff, fluffy bunny mittens and face pulling. That's what she does. She, she, she shouldn't And there's be... a place for that, I suppose. Well, is there a place for that? And this is where it comes a personal thing because Personally, I can be bothered with programmes like silly detectives like Heart to Heart and Jessica Fletcher and Agatha Raisin and Remington Love Steel. all of them? Well, <laughs> you, you and I are never going to get married. That's no, just uh, I we have we established stab. that long ago. <laughs> I think that's the case. I think if you can like that sort of genre, that silliness um, okay. and, and connected with, with a murder mystery sto story. Um, but when, we, when this character has, she gets to come in and she shows up the New York um, Police Department to be complete idiots, then I think you've got a little bit of a problem there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's slight, but, it, you, you know, it might be... <laughs> in an afternoon, you get nothing else to do. Uh, Elspeth is available on Sky and Now TV. We'll be back after 11 with more. Never mind the Paris Olympics. It didn't rain for Glasgow's Commonwealth Games opening ceremony 10 years ago this week. But should the city host it again? The Netflix comedy Comedy dubbed The White Lotus meets The Black Death and as a study suggests half of UK adults don't read anymore. We're asking for the one book you think would get a lapsed reader back into it. 80295. <laughs>
again. You're listening to Saturday Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland with me, Shireen Nanjiani, and my guests, journalist Angela Haggerty, author CJ Cook and Herald columnist Brian Beacom. And coming up in the last half hour of the show, the police warning that online influencers are radicalising boys into extreme misogyny. We review the new Netflix comedy dubbed The White Lotus Meets the Black Death. And as it's revealed that half of UK adults no longer read, our own Angela includes herself in that number. We're asking what book would you recommend to get them started again? So tell us the book that changed your life. One book that you think Angela should pick up this afternoon and have a flick through tonight. What would you choose and why? Text me on 80295. That's charged at your standard message rate. Charlie in Danoon has this shout already. To Kill a Mockingbird, he says. It's a magnificent piece of literature. Helen in Edinburgh, Mayflies by Andrew O'Hagan. A chuckle or two or three on every single page. There was a TV adaptation of that too, um, Angela, but read the book first. I'm looking forward to hearing all of your suggestions. It could give us a bit of a refresh and some new ideas for books to get into. Text me on 80295 or use the hashtag Shireen on social media. Now, never mind the Olympics, cast your mind back to this week in 2014. Yes, it's exactly 10 years since this. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome... Accompanied by His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. Yes, more than 60,000 people attended the opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Games, which featured uh, dancing tea cakes, a giant Loch Ness monster and a kilted Carindon bar. And I was there. It was a beautiful evening, unlike last night in Paris. Uh, John Barrowman and Rod Stewart also performed before the late Queen Elizabeth officially declared the Commonwealth Games open. Athletes from 71 nations and territories took part in the parade of nations in front of a crowd of more than 60,000 at Celtic Park um, and uh, you remember the Scotty dogs in, in the, the, the procession as well and I just remember I was lucky enough to get tickets for that in the draw and tickets for the velodrome and the athletics and I just remember so much positivity around Glasgow at the time, Brian. Yeah, that's certainly the case. It was a bright, sunshiny time. It was a, a time of massive celebration. And we conveniently it, forget that it chucked it down with rain later on. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> yeah, it did. But, but you know, you had a chance to you know celebrate the fact Rod Stewart's in, in town, and, um, and I think Kylie Minogue was one of the big performers of the day as well. And then, and then you had that that f fun moment when John John Barrowman shocked a live TV audience with his audacious gay kiss, which was was, was all great and wonderful. I think the problem is, though, that w for one thing, Commonwealth Games in itself has become something of an anachronism. I don't know if that so many countries wish to be celebrating the fact that Britain once controlled a Commonwealth of countries. I, I think we've probably moved on from from that now. And I think they are looking at re, you know reimagining re it, reinventing I, it. I, but the problem is as well, yeah, it has to be has to be scaled down, cut down because it's it seemed to be unaffordable because the the Commonwealth just doesn't have that sellable prestige. You can't sell it abroad to television companies well, the way that you can Olympics. Yeah, and that that is the interesting point because Glasgow um will find out in the next two or three weeks whether they're going to get to host it again in a very much more scaled down version because, you know, as you say, no one can afford to to, yeah. to, to, to go, you know, the full the full Olympics. So the question is how much? How much will the Scottish Government put into it if we do go ahead? How much will Glasgow City Council um, have to pick up a bill for? And we have to look to examples like uh, Victoria and, and Australia decided they didn't want to host it at all because it's just not financially viable anymore. So should we put money into it? I don't know. If, I don't think we should. I think because Glasgow is a very, very different place from it was 10 uh, years ago. We've got food banks now. 
we've got real problems with um, with with poverty, with child poverty. We've got problems in our schools and education. Should we not just take any money that we can raise and put it into schools to to encourage um, uh, more athletics, to encourage more sport in schools, to be able to pay teachers to turn out at weekends to take um, sports teams? Because uh, they always say about these games that they're supposed to be. A, a, a legacy, you know, that, 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 you know, people will get fitter, the Athletes Village, for example, Carolyn, um, you know, uh, w w was transformed into housing, you know, so it, is Brian right or do you think it could bring some positivity? I think in principle it would be good for the city to have that buzz, but I do agree with Brian about the spend when there are problems financially. I think it would be better to see that go particularly into schools. Um, but yeah, it's it's a shame, but you know, I would like to see that kind of um, positivity and the buzziness in the city again, but I, I think there would be a lot of criticism that might just underwhelm that positivity. Mm. Angela, your thoughts? Yeah, I think it would be a hard sell to locals because it's just, you know, the city doesn't have a great feel about it just now. You know, there's talk about there could be bin strikes again and we're waiting to see what happens. So, you know, if the government and local authority is going to put money into this, you can understand why people are going to say, all right, well, you've got money for that, but you don't have money for the pay rises. What's going on? So it's it was an easier sale in 2014 when it cost more money. I think they'll struggle to get the public back and behind it at the same time. Even, even when it's a much smaller scale? Yeah, because, I mean, it's still costing a lot. I mean, you know, the, the stri striking workers would, would say that when it comes to their wages, they're not asking for the moon here. You know, they're just asking for a better standard of living. So um, I think even if even if the government says it's it's less money, I, I still just don't think that's quite going to fly with the mood of people right now, which is a shame because I do think it would be nice to have something that we could all get behind and cheer us up a bit. But I know. like I say, I think it's a hard sale. I know. I mean, I, you know, I was saying this earlier, um, <laughs> it was only 10 years ago, but 2014 already just seems like a, a simpler time, a, a more positive time, a, well, a been, time of hope. We've been few, through a few little events since then. We've had a, a, a pandemic, for one thing, which yes. has really changed everybody's perspective. We've had an um, incredible uh, financial crisis to have to cope with. We've got, as we say, we've got urban um, poverty mm. in a way that never, ever existed in the past. Yeah, OK. Well, that's the Commonwealth game. Back to the Olympics for just a second before we move on because Alan from Selkirk has texted 80295 with a bit of praise. He says, brilliant commentary from Andrew Cotter and Hazel Irvin as all the teams sailed past. Very knowledgeable and witty. A really great combination here, here. And particularly impressed that Andrew Cotter um, was um, translating from French um, as we went along in the, well, the, yeah. the speeches. Um, Hazel and Andrew did really well. Now, we've been asking for the one book you'd recommend to get Angela back into reading. I hope you're taking notes, Angela. Already loads <laughs> to sift through. Marion in Bears Den near Glasgow says, don't take this personally, but how about <laughs> Old Baggage by Lisa Evans? Don't take it personally, Angela. A wonderful, <laughs> heartwarming book by a wonderful author. I have not heard of that. Old Baggage by Lisa Evans. Thank you for that. And keep your recommendations coming in. We'll be talking about this before 11.30 and we'll decide on one of them for Angela to get stuck into. Uh, but I tell you what wouldn't be on the list. Giovanni Boccaccio's weighty 14th century epic, The Decameron. However, Netflix are hoping that a TV series inspired by the book and starring Sorsha Monica Jackson and Zosia Mamet can light your fire. Described by one critic as the White Lotus meets the Black Death. Let's get a flavour of The Decameron. Is everywhere. But a few weeks in the countryside could do wonders for your health. Friends! Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Villa Santa! We are here to eat and drink and move into a bright new future. Have you been gutting fish, Senora? You're covered in fish cottage. Am I? Oh! I know about you. Is that a threat? It's a warning. This is quite a pickle. Quite? I ask that we live by the law of civility. But without it, we are mere beasts. Everyone's dying. Let's dance while we're still alive! 
You're going to want to see my body move. Oh. Okay, first of all, Carolyn, you are a scholar of the Decameron, the original. Um, <laughs> well, you are for our purposes. Because, okay. So tell us about that, first of all. Well, the Decameron is uh, from the 14th century writer Boccaccio. Um, it's obviously from a period that we don't regularly see adapted on television. So I was really quite confused because I thought, well, well, many people know what the Decameron is. It's, it's an odd choice, but I can. And think, what is it? Well, it's a, a series of, of tales, I suppose. I mean, I'm not sure if I would necessarily call it the White Lotus meets the Black Death, but there is, uh, you know, it's it's a romp, really. So we have that element of it here, but it's very much pitched at a Bridgerton watching audience. Right. So if you like Bridgerton, perhaps this will be your thing. So t t tell us a bit about the, the story in this. And how well, it's so we have um, the setting, Florence, which is being ravaged by plague. We have the uh, Viscount inviting um, his bride, well, his prospective bride, Pampanea, um, to stay, uh, the relatives and friends and so on. Um, but, I, I, I mean, to be honest, when I think back, the plot is not the strongest thing. It's really just a, a series of... They're all of, isolating in this villa to get away yeah. from the plague. Yes, exactly. But it's it's more of a farce than anything. Yeah. And, and lots of people, you know, fancying each other. So that's that's really, as as far as it goes, it's, yeah, it's, it's not for my demographic, I think, or I didn't particularly enjoy it, but I can see that. You know, if you enjoy Bridgerton, this might be something that you'd want to pick up on. So you think this is for a, a, that that sort of audience? It's a younger audience, yes. Right, because there, there is a sort of theme at the moment of um, going for these historical... Um, sort of fantasy historical dramas. Well, yes, because we have Lady Jean Grey as well, which, you know, seeks to re imagine, I suppose, a departure of the, the story of Henry VIII's last wife, his eighth wife. Oh, gosh. Um, but we also have supernatural elements as well. Ah, right. So it's, it's, Not it's an that, odd no. mishmash, which I think is is vaguely successful, but it's it's just quite a, a jarring watch if you're a history fan because right. we suddenly have this, you know, people turning into horses and whatnot. <laughs> what did you think of it, Angela? Because we, we've got some, we've got a star from Girls, we've got a star from Sex Education, from Dairy Girls, I get the guy from Veep in it, but by and large, it does seem to be going for maybe younger millennial audience. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. And just before I get to that, I, I got a tweet from my Grant McManus who says, been looking forward to Elspeth. More so now, Brian doesn't like it. So there you, go, <laughs> you see, that's an endorsement for a lot of people, Brian. <laughs> well, well, yeah, it takes all time. Um, so but for the Decameron, it, it was it was bizarre. It was a bit like Time, time Bandits. I was just thinking, I don't know what I'm watching here. And it's definitely pitched at a different audience than me. It's not really my thing. But I thought there was something in it for, see, for that younger millennial, audience that lost a lot of just that like outrageous absurd bits of their lives because of covid it's almost like there's there's something being channeled in there through this story of the black death and how all these young people are going to go away to this you know country retreat and just be outrageous and absurd there's something in that yeah. i think that might appeal to that audience but that's just not me. So I don't think I'd say... There was a few quite funny one-liners in it. Um, Production-wise, it was quite interesting to watch. But again, like Bridgerton didn't really appeal, uh, appeal to me. So it's just not my thing. But maybe for others. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's interesting you mentioned that young people in the pandemic. The creator, Kathleen Jordan, said that one of the incentives for writing it came early in the pandemic when all these various uh, celebrities were complaining about being imprisoned in their multi-million dollar oh, wow, mansions. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I think there was a big element of that, but I have to say, and I don't try not to resort to hyperbole on this one, but if, if this is probably one of the worst television programmes I think I've ever had to... to oh, to you say that every No, week, I don't Brian. think I do. No, to be fair. Come on, to be fair. And um, uh, But I think if it weren't for Loudermilk and Netflix, I think I would probably cancel my subscription. I thought that, I thought the writing of this was really terrible. And I think what... I could see what they were trying to do. I think what the, the writer was trying to do was to juxtapose this state of absolute desperation that people um, find themselves in. And I think the COVID rever reference is, is relevant. So you want to have a good time. So you put a lot of young people together in a big stately home and see what they can 
get her up to. And what they did get up to was attempt to have lots of sex and so lot, lot, lots of sexual int- intrigue and character interplay and that sort of thing. But there were no laughs in it. She just couldn't get laughs anywhere. There was not a for scene. For you? No, not for... I've, I've read lots of credits and people have said very good things about the programme itself but, but still said they couldn't find a laugh. And so I defy anybody to come up with the points that were really, really funny. And that, I feel like the opposite. I think sometimes it was a little bit uncomfortable to be watching in, in one or two of the sex scenes. Um, so it, it, it couldn't work. I, I think you can make a really, really good series out of death, disease and desperation. I think that if you want to see an example of that working so well, look at a Black Adder episode, series one, episode five, when it, it looked at the Black Death mm-hmm. and considered the effect of that. And uh, that's where it really, really got laughs, when you had a witch finder general chasing around Prince Edmund. Okay. Accusing him of having an affair with his horse. Okay, well, That's where it works. Right. Brian says it doesn't work. A lot of the critics said that it didn't make them laugh, but they're all older than a younger millennial audience. You have a daughter who liked Bridgerton. Do you My think she would like this? Loves Bridgerton, and I think she would like this too. So it's not not for me, but I think it would be for her. Okay, right. Well, that is the Decameron, not not for us, and not for Brian. So <laughs> our, our texter um, um, probably will like this too. <laughs> if Brian didn't like it, uh, all episodes of the Decameron available on Netflix. And before we move on, we were we're going to be talking shortly about the half of. UK adults who don't read or have given up. Angela is with us. She's one of them. And thank you so much for all your recommendations for this morning. Let's hear a couple more. Les says, I would definitely recommend A Man Called Ove by Frederick Bachman. A brilliant moving story which will also make you smile. Just avoid the dreadful Tom Hanks movie adaptation. Anne says, something different to get you back into it. Try a wee book called Hod That Bus. Can't remember the author. It's really good fun. If you really feel you're on a day out with... You really feel that you're on a day out with the two characters, Barbara and Molly. Matt has looked it up. It's by an author called Alan Morrison. So that's Hod That Bus. And Susan in Eaglesham says, A thousand splendid sons, Khaled Hussein. Each one has lived with me. Wonderful. Well, your mu- what is your must-read book for Angela? And to give us all some inspiration this morning, you can text me on 80295. I see a street, a nice wide street. And I'm up there, just going for a walk. I'm not scared of falling, because there's nothing to fall from. Shannon Miller is ready. Are you? The 1994 Goodwill Games, the world's best, beginning July 23rd on TBS. Coming up after us at 11.30 on BBC Radio Scotland, it's Breaking the News with Des Clark and his guests this week include Felicity Ward and Chris Forbes. At 12, it's Off the Ball with Ray Bradshaw and Mark Nelson, followed at 2 by Sports Sound with all the action from the Scottish League Cup, including commentary of Hibernian versus Peter Head. At 10 o'clock tonight, Billy Sloan wants to know your favourite Top of the Pops performance. With my guests, Angela Haggerty, CJ Cook and Brian Beacom. Well, now to a shocking report from the National Police Chiefs Council this week that describes boys being radicalised into extreme misogyny in a similar way to followers being groomed into terrorism. And it named the self-proclaimed misogynist Andrew Tate as one of the online influencers of concern. The National Police Chiefs Council described the issue as a national emergency as it published a report into violence against women and girls. Senior police officer Maggie Blythe said officers who focused on violence against women and girls were now working with counter-terrorism teams to look at the risk of young men being radicalised. The group said that the evidence they've seen is quite terrifying. Um, Let me get your reaction to this, um, you know, this move, Angela, of actually, you know, naming it as, you know, radicalisation and comparing it to terrorism. I think it's interesting. It's maybe 
trying to take a different approach to it. Um, but it's a, it is an age-old problem. It just manifests in different ways. And when I was younger, I remember it was like the rise of MTV and all the music channels, and it was the, the rappers with women in them and how they were depicting women and how they were uh, rapping about women, that that was seen to be something having a terrible effect on younger boys. And then it was the rise of online pornography because young people had such access to that that they had never had before. Now it's things like Andrew Tate and TikTok and all these influencers so the, the method kind of changes but the problem remains the same it just becomes expressed in different ways and I don't really think that we've got to the the root of that the danger of, of going down the terror route or that, that extremely punitive kind of approach is that again you're you're looking to punish the problem but not looking to to get underneath the skin of the problem and understand why it's happening because we've we've been incredibly unsuccessful at doing that and it doesn't it doesn't appear that we're, we're getting any further forward there yeah Brian yeah, I, I, I kind of agree pretty much with what Angela's saying there. And I think you really need to get into the heart of the problem. But I think you can use Andrew Tate as an example to get to the heart of the problem. There's a, I read a report this week about a teacher who was in Belfast and she was using Andrew Tate as a great example to, to educate the young boys in her classroom. And she was saying to them, what do you think of Andrew Tate? And here are some of the comments he made. And some of the kids, some of the boys were defending Andrew Tate and said, well, he's a bit like family, so you have to accept what family members have. You know, if they do something wrong, you have to accept it and move on. And But she managed to use the line, she took that example and she broke it down saying, would you really want a, a family member, one of your brothers, to say that about a, 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 a girl that you knew? And the, what, she managed to, to, to get an answer that really was positive at the end of the day. So I think it is about education. But I think there's other things going on as well. I think there's a wee bit of displacement activity here in the police force um, um, to be to be citing the um, National Police Chiefs Council to be citing Andrew Tate as an example because you have to look at the horrendous situation that police forces across the country have found, particularly London's metropolitan police who have been described as institutionally misogynistic themselves. So, um, yeah, look at Andrew Tate, but look, look within as well. Carolyn? I think influencers like Andrew Tate are symptomatic of a larger problem. Again, I don't know what that how to find the root of that problem, but he is not... I think he's possibly contributing, but he's symptomatic mostly. Okay. Let's uh, move on to our final item in the programme because uh, a report this week suggested that half of all UK adults don't read for pleasure. With many of that number, as much as a third of adults being lapse readers who used to enjoy sitting down with a book but now find it doesn't have the same appeal. Well, when respondents were asked what's stopping them from reading, they cited various reasons from a lack of time to the distraction of social media. Almost a fifth of those surveyed by charity, the reading agency said that guidance on how to choose appropriate books could get them back into reading again. And that's where our um, listeners come in because uh, they've all uh, got uh, their suggestions this morning and thanks for them. We'll come to some more of them in a minute. But um, this must worry you as an author. Carolyn. It does. It really, it really concerns me. And I am constantly nagging at my kids to read and it baffles me that they are... One of them is a reader, but the others are not so inclined and I understand it's because they have such access to social media to their phones okay it's very difficult I'm, I'm up against quite a bit actually okay well Angela you've spoken about this before what are the yeah. barriers for you to to reading to me, it's just a very personal thing that I can't seem to get into. My mind wanders off when I'm reading. I can't remember what I read in the last two pages. I have to keep flicking back. And I just find the whole thing really frustrating. I don't know why my brain won't engage it because I get very jealous of people who talk about how much they love books and I love the idea of getting lost in a book. I just can't seem to do it. But there you go. Maybe I just haven't found the right one. So thank you, everyone, for the recommendations because I quite like the sound of mayflies, the idea of a, a child chuckle in every page. That's quite appealing. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, th th there's, there's more than a, a chuckle. There's some moving bits as well. It, it, it goes back to the, the 80s as well, but you might recognise um, um, parts of sc Scotland in that. So I think you might like that one. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Brian? Oh, I, I mean, I, I love reading. I had a paperback in my 
pocket of my duffel coat as, since I was, you know, 12 years old. Do you still was, do that? Yeah, I don't have that same duffel coat, but yeah, <laughs> metaphorically, I kind of do. Although there has something, I can pick up a wee bit with Angela saying there to a certain extent. I don't read fiction anymore. Oh, uh, do you not? No, I don't. I think the, the, the prose is just a wee bit too slow. I, I read plays every single week and I read biographies and autobiographies. So I'm more into the immediacy of writing and, uh, and, and, and lovely colour expressed express through dialogue um but fiction mm, and it's too hit and miss okay well we've we've got some more for you angela um you know take a note of all of these and um, some of these i've read louise in glasgow says eleanor oliphant is completely fine by gail honeyman set in glasgow and just lovely linda and sterling tell angela to try a real oldie book shoes were for sunday by the irrepressible molly weir full of wonderful <laughs> writing humor and pathos Craig, doing wedding flowers in Fife, says, For One More Day by Mitch Albom. It's a really small book published in 2006. Philosophical, emotional, had me in tears and immediately encouraged me to reconnect with my mother from whom I drifted. I think that one little story would heal so many wounds if everyone had the chance to read it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I think I found the one, Angela. Have a listen to this from Alison. She says, the new book by David Nichols called You Are Here. And the best news is I live below Angela so she can pop down and borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> that is your neighbour. <laughs> Brilliant. So, so there I'll be you are. the door after the show. <laughs> there you go. Not only have you got a recommendation, you're making new connections. Um, I noticed actually that a lot of these recommendations also have movie adaptations. I always say, read the book first. And on that note, we have to leave it. I'll be here next week. It's breaking the news now. Bye bye. <laughs>